Valley Baptist Church to have a couple of men that are retired pastors. Uh, one of them is Pastor Gerald. The other is Pastor Mitch, who was here earlier today. But Pastor Gerald's going to uh, preach for me this morning, and we're just uh, blessed to have this guy and his wife, Marilyn. Yeah, amen. <laughs> he's usually in the second service, so not all of you guys know him. <laughs> but if he sounds funny, it's okay. He's from Canada. See, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to keep the A's down, okay? Thank you, brother. God, <laughs> hey, God bless you. you. Okay. Well, it is a privilege to be here this morning, and uh, when you don't do it all the time, it's uh, a little different experience to get up and uh, preach, and, but uh, I've been looking forward to this since Pastor uh, Steve asked me a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to give an, uh, one more announcement. My wife and I live on the west end of town by Cheyenne and 215. We're about a mile and a half from that interchange, about a mile from uh, 215 in Lone Mountain. And we would like to start a Bible study in our home. If you're up in that area of town and would like to be part of a Bible study on Tuesday nights, my phone number is in the bulletin. Give us a call. And uh, this week is Halloween, so we're not going to have a meeting, but we're going to start the following week. I'm going to begin with a series called The Prodigal God. It's a, 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 a DVD series, and I invite you to be part of that. So give me a call in the next 10 days, and uh, let me know that you're interested. I'd appreciate that very much. You know, you were singing earlier, you know, and uh, raise your hands, and my wife is like this, and Ani is like this. You know, old guys like me, when they ask me to raise my hands, this is my natural reaction, just about like this, right? I, I just don't, we all worship differently, but we come and God meets our needs, however our, we're comfortable with our worship and uh, as we uh, uh, work together. Let's ask God to anoint this time. Father in heaven, we thank you for allowing us to have your word, your eternal inerrant word that we can study, that we can look at, that we can apply to our lives. And Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would be here this morning and he would just touch each one of us and allows us to sense your leading and guiding in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever wondered why bad things happen to good people? Have you ever been in a situation where you're kind of sitting there saying, what next? I don't know how much more I can take. I don't know what the next steps are. Or when you're in the center of God's will like Elijah was, how can the brook dry up? How come God allow some of these things to happen? And in 1 Kings uh, chapter 17, and we're going to uh, have all the scripture, most of the scripture up on the screen, but if you want to follow in your Bible, I invite you to do it. Israel is in a time of spiritual drought. They've got a terrible king. His name is Ahab. And his wife Jezebel is equally wicked. They are idol-worshipping, pagan-worshipping king and queen who are just leading Israel away from God about as far as you could get. And Elijah comes along and he is called by God to speak. And so in chapter 17, we see Elijah making the pronouncement it's not going to rain until he says it's going to rain, and that's about three and a half years. God tells him to go hide by a brook, but then the brook dries up. God sends him to enemy territory to live with a widow. And also, in that time, there's personal tragedy. And so we see something of the faithfulness, the care that we can trust God through this um, experience that we have. Now, in 1 Kings 17, I didn't put on verse 1 on here. Now, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I am served, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. And then let's pick it up here. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here and go or turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord told him. He went to Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometimes later, sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. 
Can you imagine? He makes this pronouncement before the court, Ahab in the court probably. And then he is sent off to be by himself. As I said, three and a half years. I do not know how long he was at the brook and how long he was with the widow. But for an extended period of time, Elijah lived alone. And he was fed meat and bread with ravens, by ravens, morning and night. Now, you think some of the practical things of that. Living alone is no fun for that long, for sure, having nobody to talk to. But you ever think he wondered when the ravens came? Ravens are dirty birds. They, they, they like roadkill. Do you ever think he wondered, I wonder what he was eating before he brought me my bread? I'm not sure. But he knew that God was faithful and that God supplied his needs along the way. Now, the reason why no rain was such a significant thing, Baal worship was a fertility cult. It was for, they said that he forgave the crops. He gave the rain. And by God allowing Elijah to pray for drought and there be no drought in the land, or no rain in the land, it showed that God was stronger than Baal. Now the reason Ahab had to hide, I mean, um, uh, Elijah had to hide, we find near the end of the three and a half years, he runs into a prophet uh, or a worker named Obadiah, not a prophet, a worker uh, uh, named Obadiah. And Obadiah is faithful to God. He, in fact, he's one of these guys who works for the king, but his loyalty is to God even in that pagan situation. He hides a hundred prophets, 50 in two caves, and supplies water and food for them during this time when Ahab and Jezebel are trying to kill the prophets of God. And this is what Obadiah says to uh, Elijah. Surely as the Lord your God lives, there's not a nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to look for you. And wherever a nation or kingdom claims you were not there, he made them swear they could not find you. He was not just saying, have you seen him? They were saying, I want you looking for him. And for three and a half years at Kareth and then at Zarephath, God hid Elijah. He lived alone and God was faithful morning and night. Now there's some lessons to be learned at the brook. The same God who gives water is the God who can take that water away. When we have an abundance, we say, oh, God is blessing me. But sometimes when the book, brook begins to dry up, we say, God's got something against me. That's not necessarily the case. Because it doesn't mean God loves us any less when the brook dries up. Remember that. He just wants to teach us some lessons along the way. And notice the brook dries up. Why? Because of Elijah's prayer. Get that. It says the brook dried because there was no rain. Who prayed for no rain? Elijah. I remember years ago I, in a church that I was pastoring, there was a couple came to my church and they just accepted the Lord just before I got there. And they started coming uh, when I uh, started pastoring that church and I did a lot of counseling with them. The husband had had a mistress for 15 years and the wife stayed with him because of the kids. And now they became born again believers. And I could tell a long story here, but I wanted to just tell you one small part of it. And I was counseling them. And every time they were seemingly getting it together, their daughter, who's about 16, would just, just give them fits. Okay, she was just mean, nasty, and just, just tore up the household. And they had several children, but this, you know, but 16-year-old girl was just hard to live with. And so we started to pray, God, do not give her peace until she finds peace with you. The three of us coveted together to pray that. And I remember the mother coming into my office one day after Thursday morning Bible study that we had at the church for ladies. She sat in my office and she said, 
you wouldn't believe this week. She named her daughter, and she said, you know what she said to me? She said she wished Dad would choose and name the mistress instead of me. She says, I stayed because of the kids. She says, I don't know how much more I can take now. They're turning on me. You see, when you pray, they will not rain. Sometimes the brook drying up affects us. Now, the good news of this story, about a year later, that girl became a Christian. About five years after that, I performed her marriage, I dedicated her first baby, and her and her mom, best of friends. But in that period of time, so remember when you pray, it doesn't always mean it's going to be easy. Prayers result in the brook's drying up. And then preparation for his public ministry involves alone time by the brook. Do you know how many Bible characters, and I only named, I'm going to name three. Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness taking care of sheep. David spent years taking care of his father's sheep all by himself. Paul was three years, three, a little over three years probably, between the time he was saved and when Barnabas called him to go and start the missionary work together. We see God using alone time to speak. I wonder in our day and age, when we live in a society with these things I got in my pocket, if I could find it, figure out which pocket's in, and if we've got 30 seconds, we're on here. And we're on FaceTime, we're texting, we're checking the news, or sports scores, whatever it might be. And I wonder if God ever looks down from heaven and says, boy, I wish I could have a little bit of time where I could speak to these people. I wish they'd slow up and clear their mind for me to speak into their lives. The alone time prepared him for ministry. But then, God moves him. And he goes off to a widow's house. Now the Bible says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. Now, I wonder if Elijah took a double take. Sidon is where Jezebel grew up. Her father, Ethbel, was still the king of Sidon. And God says, I want you to go to Jezebel's backyard, and I want you to live there. Jesus said there were lots of widows in Israel at that time. But God sends Elijah off to a widow in Sidon. And so he goes there, and he asks for food. Notice this. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may drink? She was going to get it, and he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. Pretty simple request, especially of a stranger in town. But there's a lot more to it. The last thing this woman needs is another mouse to feel, feed. Notice what it says. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. She's pretty desperate. <laughs> Down to the last meal. And this, folks, there's no social security. There's no gospel mission. There's no other family that she can go to now. She is feeling alone. They're going to have this meal and then they're just going to die together. They're going to starve. Pretty desperate. But Elijah speaks to her. Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain to the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her.
you see something here? God had told, he said, I'm going to get the ravens to take care of your food. And they, they responded. This woman didn't have as clear a message from God, it seemed like, because she was kind of wondering, hey, I only have got a little bit of oil, a little bit of flour. But she was obedient with what she had. Can you imagine mothers or dads down to the last meal and there's nothing else and nowhere you think you can get any more and you're going to share that with somebody, a stranger? Can any of us imagine that situation? And so, as a result of her obedience and the faith of Elijah and the providence of God, so there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family, for the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Do you notice three and a half years, the first party was having meat and bread and the last However long, he was just having bread. I have a sister-in-law who was born in Belgium. And her very young part of her life, her childhood life, was during World War II. And Belgium was occupied by the German army. And she didn't talk about it very much. But I remember her telling a story that during the, the war, they had food because they had a garden and they had some chickens and they, you know, there was the you know, basics, the you know, bread in the, you could get. They had the basics. But when the German forces moved out and before the Allied forces got there, it got to be very, very hard because the supply lines were not there and the German forces had taken kind of all the prepared food they could carry for themselves away. And I remember telling the story about having bread and wishing, you know, if I just had a little bit of butter. And then they said, we got some butter. And after a short while, thinking, I was going to have some jam. And then they got something to put on it. And then, you know how we are. Elijah lived with this woman for three and a half, well, part of three and a half years, a good part of it, and all they had was bread. You know, last night, my wife, we have company at our home, and my wife made this wonderful meal, and we ate it out in the backyard by the pool, and just a glorious evening. And I said to her before we went to bed, I said, that was just a phenomenal meal. Can you imagine Elijah saying to the widow, that was a great meal today. Hey, it's the same one you've had the last six months, you know, like uh, morning and night, the same thing. Very basic. But there's lessons to be learned at the pool. Or, I mean, at the, um, at the widow's house. God's leading is often surprising. Why would you take me there? And yet the provision was there. When we follow God's leading, the first steps are often the most difficult. That first day when the woman... The widow shared her flour and her oil and a, little, a small loaf of bread with Elijah. That was the toughest. Because after that, the pattern was there. And in, in obedience to God, when God calls us to step out in faith, when God calls us to do something, sometimes that first step is the hardest. Because God, if it's of God, will see his faithfulness. And we'll see his hand moving. And God's promises hinge on obedience. If Elijah wouldn't have gone, the woman wouldn't have obeyed, there would have been no promise there. There would have no bread there, the promise wouldn't have been fulfilled. And lastly, Elijah's contentment. There's no complaint through all this time, either by the brook or at the widow's home. None at all. But then there's personal tragedy. Notice this passage starts off with some time later. Sometime later, is, we don't know how long, but Elijah's living in the house. He's still not been found out by the king uh, or any army official. They're still getting provision every day. But sometime later, 
a tragedy comes. And all of us have found times when hard things come. You know, my wife found, me an, uh, found this article many years ago and gave it to me, and I found it helpful when a dream dies. And it's written by a woman whose child has spina bifida. And it's entitled, Welcome to Holland. It's very short, I'm gonna read it to you this morning. She said, I'm often asked to describe the experience of raising a child with a disability. To try to help people who have not shared this unique experience to understand it, to imagine how it would feel, it's like this. When you're going to have a baby, it's like planning a fabulous vacation trip to Italy. You buy a bunch of guidebooks, the Colosseum, Michelangelo's David, the gondolas in Venice. You learn some handy phrases in Italian and it's all very exciting. After months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives. You pack your bags and off you go. Several hours later, the plane lands and the stewardess says, welcome to Holland. Holland, you say? What do you mean, Holland? I signed up for Italy. I'm supposed to be in Italy. All my life I've dreamed of going to Italy. But there's been a change in the flight plan. You've landed in Holland and there you must stay. The important thing is that you haven't been taken to a horrible, disgusting, filthy place full of pestilence, famine, and disease. It's just a different place. So you must go out and buy new guidebooks. You must learn a whole new language. You must meet a whole new group of people that you've never met. It's just a different place. It's a slower pace than Italy. It's less flashy than Italy. But after you've been there for a while, you catch your breath and you look around and you begin to notice that Holland has windmills. Holland has tulips, and Holland even has Rembrandts. But everybody you know is busy coming and going from Italy, and they're all bragging about what a wonderful time they have had. And for the rest of your life, you say, yes, that's where I was supposed to go, and that's what I had planned. And the pain of that will never, ever go away, because the loss of a dream is a very significant loss. But... If you spend your life mourning the fact that you didn't get to Italy, you may never be free to enjoy the very special, the very lovely things about Holland. You see, the loss of a dream, whether your retirement is not like it you hoped it was, relationship is not like you hoped, or a child that uh, is not uh, like you hoped, those significant losses. But look around for the blessings in it. Because this is what we see through this tragedy at the widow's home. Grieving the loss of a child is something that I haven't had to experience personally in our family. We have three healthy children, and uh, we've got several, can't even tell you how many right now, uh, healthy grandchildren. And, and uh, they you know, were just praising the Lord for his goodness. But Carl Jung, the uh, Swiss psychologist, said, the death of a child is the most unnatural and hardest to bear. It's a period placed before the end of a sentence, sometimes when the sentence has hardly begun. You expect the old to die. The separation is always difficult, but it comes as no surprise. But the child, the youth, life lies ahead with all its beauty, its wonder, its potential. Death is a cruel thief when it strikes down the young. Joseph Bailey wrote a book entitled View from a Hearse. And um, if you've never read it, it's a good read. Joseph Bailey and his wife have, had lost three children. One at 15 days after surgery, or 18 days, I think, after surgery. A five-year-old to leukemia and an 18-year-old to a sledding accident. And his, his description of going through leukemia with a five-year-old is heart-wrenching. But he talks of the faithfulness of God. He talks of how God is there with them, walking with them, and God's care. Again, a view from the hearse, it's a, word, it's a good read. But back to the Bible story. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house becomes ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. And she said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Many years ago, before cell phones, 
It was about 7, 7.30 in the morning. I was ready to go to the office. I got a phone call. And I got a phone call from a very active couple in our church. This couple had three daughters. Two were married and they lived not in the city where we lived, away. Very active in their churches, very uh, close to the Lord in their walk. But the third daughter lived in this town that, or the city we lived in. And uh, she had struggled with her Christian walk, struggled with life, with lots of things. And I got a phone call from them and they said, name the daughter, her baby has died. It was about six weeks old. Well, I was ready to go, so I hopped in the car. And they didn't live that far from us. I drove over there and, and got to the house. And I even beat the ambulance. And the husband was looking for the ambulance to come and he opened let me in. And she was sitting on the couch trying to get this baby, and I'm no medical person, but this baby was dead, to nurse and just asking the baby over and over to, to eat. And the ambulance comes right after I'm there and uh, um, uh, the, EMT come, the EMTs come into the house and they go to take the baby and she wouldn't give it to them. And they kind of looked at the husband and he shook his head and points at me. So I go to her and I kneel down in front of her and I said, I named her, I said something like, you know, these are medical professionals. If anyone can help your baby, they can. So I'm going to take her and give it to them, give her to them. I took the baby, she let me take it and I gave it to them and I went and sat beside her and she just started to cry. And she was sobbing, she said, it's my fault, it's my fault, God is judging me. You see, when times like this come, we often say, God is trying to get back at me. God is somehow trying to get back at me. And a sin jumps out and hits us. If you're there this morning, I want you to know that Jesus Christ came to pay for every sin. Now, if you go out and rob a bank, there's consequences. You're going to go to jail. But if with God, we can have all things right. We can have all things good. We can have all things forgiven. If you're willing to ask for his forgiveness, repent of your sin and turn from it. At the end of the service, if you want to talk to anybody, how you can have anyone here about having a relationship with Jesus Christ, we just love to talk to you about that. It's one of the greatest things going. So the child dies, and this is Elijah's response. He doesn't get mad at her um, being upset with him. This goes off and on again, right? Okay, if I get this right, okay, we got the light again. He said, give me your son, Elijah replied, took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying in the, and laid him on the bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I am staying with by causing your son to die? Then he stretched himself out in the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O oh God, O oh Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. You know, he had prayed and it wouldn't rain and it didn't rain. God took care of him at the brook. God takes him to this widow and he's kept protected. But this is the biggest challenge yet. This is the biggest challenge yet. And so he, in faith, stretches out over the child and prays. You know, there are only, I think, about six or seven, I don't know how many, I, I, know, I know of five before the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's Elijah. Elisha has two coming back from the dead. Jairus' daughter under Jesus' ministry. And Lazarus. And then there's that guy that falls out of the second story uh, roof when he falls asleep in church. Uh, remember him in, in the book of Acts? There's only a handful in the Bible of people coming back to life. All these to die again. Jesus is the only one who come up from, came up from the grave never to die again. So we have a living hope and a Savior who intercedes for us. But here is the first in the Bible. And Elijah prays. And God does a miraculous thing. He does a miraculous thing. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down to the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are man of God and that the word of the Lord 
is, uh, from your mouth is the truth. See, Elijah's being prepared for greater ministry. In a very short time, he's going to be confronting 450 prophets of Baal. He thinks he's going to have another several hundred of Asher, but the um, Asheroth, but uh, Jezebel is, is too smart to send them all. She keeps them back. And so he meets face Mount Carmel. He faces alone, one against 450. God is using all these experiences to build his faith, to build along the way. So what are some of the lessons we learn from the widow's house? Well, first of all, we know that Elijah demonstrated self-control, love, and compassion. She attacks him. What have you got against me? I've taken care of you. I've had you in my house. What have you got against me? He doesn't respond. He doesn't lash out. He simply acts. Second thing, he demonstrates undiminished faith. Faith that trusts God even to bring a child back to life. And he shows great humility. He doesn't take any credit. He just gives the child. And there the child is celebrating life with the mom. So what do we learn from this account in the Bible? Why did God keep this for us today? I think there's several reasons. Maybe you're in a place today that someone or some sin God is calling you to confront. Maybe it's time to call it like it is. Again, make sure it's from the Lord and you're not getting out your personal frustration and anger and do it in love. But is God calling you to be his spokesman? Is God calling you to spend some time in quiet contemplation of his faithfulness like Elijah by the brook? Maybe God's telling you to slow up a little bit, not fill every moment of every day with all of the worries and hustle and bustle of life. Just to back off and take some time to contemplate what he wants for you and what he wants you to do. Is God leading you in a surprising direction? I love Pastor Steve when he was telling me Year, uh, about, you know, called to ministry and feeling that maybe God was calling him. And, you know, like from an engineer to a pastor, you know, like that's quite a change, right? You know, surprising. When they got married, no idea of that. And now look where they are and look at the wonderful job they're doing. God is, God is asking you to humble yourself to ask someone for help. We live in a society and we just love to do it on our own. The self-made man or the self-made woman, we, we lift up high. But sometimes God asks us to ask others for help so we can be ministered to. Are you too proud? If you are, put your pride away. Just let God use someone to minister to your heart. Are you being challenged by God to be obedient in something very hard, like the widow sharing her last meal? Obedience is not always easy. But obedience is the only way to have fulfillment in Jesus. Is God calling you to demonstrate love, self-control, and compassion to someone who has hurt you? Is God asking you today to forgive? And lastly, is God preparing you to step out in some kind of service for his kingdom? See, Elijah didn't know how it was going to end up three and a half years when he said it wasn't going to rain. But God led him to Mount Carmel and the challenge. All the stuff in between, the brook, the widow, personal tragedy in the home, all of that was preparing for the next step of service. And you look back in your last year, six months, ten years, whatever it might be, how has God been preparing you for service? Will you join me in prayer? Father, as we conclude this hour today, I pray that you would help us to listen to your spirit 
and hear that still, small voice speak to us. May today, Lord, we hear you say to us, I have prepared this or I have prepared that for you. May we hear you say, I'm leading you here or there. Father, as we give ourselves to you at this time, I pray that this, these moments of personal reflection might lead to dedication. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This morning, if you've made a commitment to Jesus Christ or you'd like to talk about how you can know Jesus as your personal Savior, Pastor Steve would love to come and uh, talk with you. I'd love to talk with you. Or if you've made a, a commitment uh, to the Lord here as we've been going through this, you want to come and pray. We're just going to allow the instrumentalist to lead us in a few moments of silent meditation as he leads us in, in a song but that we can be just with the Lord. Will you respond to him?